Bar, and welcome to Vive Nutrition Radio, the first ever Spanglish podcast where you will hear interviews with the top minds in nutrition, performance, fitness, and health in both English and Spanish. Here is your host, expert registered dietitian, Andres Ayesta, on a mission to help you take your nutrition to the next level. Hope you're ready for this. Let's dive right in. What's up, boys and girls? Welcome back to another episode of Vive Nutrition Radio. This is your host, Andres Ayesta. Um, I am excited to present to you guys an exciting episode on a topic that is often very complicated, um, very important for you to remember or for you to understand. And of course, I have to bring somebody that knew what he was talking about, an expert in the field, an expert in hormone optimization. Today's conversation is with um, a second timer on the podcast, and his name is Sam Miller, and he is a nutrition coach. Um, I met him through Instagram, and we had a great podcast a few uh, months ago talking about hormones and how do they affect nutrition, um, basically metabolism, and um, obviously the ability to see results and how he implements that with his clients. So I promise you guys that I would bring him back. And this was actually a recording that we did. Uh, we did an Instagram live and we simultaneously recorded this as a podcast. So you hear obviously him saying hi to some people that join and so forth. Uh, but, but just to give you kind of like the short of it and the summary, we talked about cortisol, its effects um, on the body, how sometimes chronic cortisol elevation can affect your body's response to certain things. How does sometimes does stress affect your responses to metabolism, to um, fuel utilization and um, nutrition overall? And we talked about some practical ways in which people can um, take control over their cortisol fluctuations on a daily basis and how, what can you do um, to take care of that yourself if you're a high stress person or if you may suspect that you may have some uh, fluctuations that are abnormal in your cortisol responses that may be affecting that the way that your body is responding to results when it comes down to nutrition and fitness. So hopefully you enjoyed this conversation uh, with Sam Miller. He has a pretty cool offer at the end, or not necessarily an offer, but he does have a brand new ebook that just released. So you're going to have to listen to um, this entire podcast to the end to find out what it is. So without further ado, hopefully, hopefully you'll enjoy this conversation with Sam Miller. See you guys next week. And remember, don't forget to leave a review. Um, on this podcast, because the more that you do that, the more people can watch it or hear it or listen to it. Um, so thank you guys. Super forever grateful for y'all. Um, love you. And I'll talk to you later. So I thought, and, and I'll let you know. So what I, what I thought about we, the way we can kind of do this and for people listening in, um, we want to make sure we break this, this conversation down into three parts because I want to make sure that people understand exactly what we're going to be talking about. Um, and first of all, part one, we're going to talk about understanding the basics of cortisol and its relationship to stress. Um, part two, we can talk probably about the disruptions to like that balance that sometimes exist um, as a result of obviously when cortisol kind of goes off track. And then like the part three, which is essentially just like the application, which is like what can people do about this? And what can people do as far as like, you know, regulating cortisol levels and so forth. Sound good to you? Sounds good, man. Awesome. Man. I will so, follow your lead. <laughs> cool. So <laughs> why don't we just kind of start from the beginning and, and you're an expert in hormone optimization. So just like, let's got, let's dive right into the nitty gritty stuff and talk a bit about what cortisol is. I feel like the, the first like step that we need to take is defining cortisol um, and its role in the body. And then we'll dive a little bit more into how it stress affects it. Sure. So uh, cortisol is part of a sort of family of hormones. Uh, it would be classified as a steroid, which uh, for those of you who are maybe less familiar with endocrinology, think about if you had inflammation or you had an injury or maybe you played football um, or something, you might get cortisone cream for that. You might get um, a cortisone injection. So when you have like a rash or something to bring down inflammation, we even get corticosteroids from our doctors. Cortisol is not so different. So in our body, it has a few different roles. Um, it helps to break down and basically create energy. It is a bit of a fight or flight response and in response to acute stress. And oftentimes the problem that we run into uh, with clients or just in our day-to-day -day lives are, are that we really sort of perpetuate uh, stress to where it becomes chronic stress instead of just being 
uh, these little bouts of acute stress that we were meant to handle, like maybe getting food or uh, running from something threatening or seeking shelter or dealing with some sort of, you know, natural disaster or something like that. Those would be bouts of acute stress. You know, chronic stress is kind of when we're under stress all the time. So cortisol in the body signals this um, rush or kind of flooding neurotransmitters that make us more alert. So catecholamines, we have adrenaline, norepinephrine, and different things that begin to sort of uh, make our body prepared to deal with whatever the stressor is. And you can see how this is a problem in modern society when we get stressed out reading an email and our body is flooding with all of these things to give us energy. Well, guess what? I don't need energy to sit at my desk and read. I need energy when I go to the gym. I need energy when I'm in motion. Um, and, and the problem we've run into is that stress has become very decoupled uh, from movement, whereas previously, thousands of years ago, even hundreds of years ago, most of our day-to-day -day stress was paired with movement. Um, and that's super important to sort of acknowledge and recognize. But simply put, uh, what largely regulates cortisol in the body is our, our brain, which basically our hypothalamus and our pituitary gland. Don't worry about spelling those, memorizing those, anything like that. Just understand that like the brain is a huge part of the endocrine system. A lot of people forget that. They think about hormones and metabolism and they forget that the brain is so, so important. So really it starts with our brain as the sensory organ is perceiving stress all the time. Um, and then moving from that, our adrenals ultimately produce uh, quite a bit of, of hormones on their own. So cortisol sort of falls into that family of stress hormones. In a, in a normal situation, it would give us energy to deal with a bout of acute stress. It's kind of the s most simple way that I would define it. Our adrenal glands are, are closer in our body, like moved away from the brain. We're moving a little bit closer down towards the kidneys and other organs like that. Uh, location isn't you know, critically important, but just so you guys understand that there's a communication basically top down. You can't really see my hands right now, but um, top down from the brain through other parts of the body. And we work on this loop where uh, everything's sort of communicating together. And cortisol is just like one part of that really big equation of our day-to-day -day hormonal balance and function. That's great. And, and you hear a lot about information and, and I, I guess like you're talking about this connection and I see it as like this, like, you know, kind of like chain that connects from the brain down to your adrenals as, and, and I guess like, you know, correct me if the wrong, uh, the, the name is the HPA axis and you hear, because I work yeah. with a lot of like, you know, CrossFit athletes and elite level athletes and so forth. And they talk a lot about, well, HPA axis, I'm like beating down my HPA axis and stuff like that. Can you kind of like, um, shed some light more on, you know, what that is and its relationship to cortisol, which I guess is all, you know, connected. That's like the chain yeah. that you're talking about, right? Yeah, for sure. So, um, HPA axis stands for hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenals. Your hypothalamus, um, and pituitary, their role is to sense current levels of hormones in the body and then trigger a a cascade or a response. So for example, um, you know, you and I are, are both guys when our body senses that in a healthy male, if testosterone was low, our hypothalamus and pituitary would then, um, send stimulating hormones to then produce more of the hormone that we need in our body. It's kind of like a thermostat. So, um, in, in my house right now in North Carolina, and I'm sure I think you're in Florida, it was pretty hot today. So if I have the air conditioner on and it's hot outside, uh, basically the air that's flowing inside is regulated based on what is sort of perceived by the thermostat, by the HVAC unit. Our body sort of has its own HVAC system, its own thermostat, and it's perceiving all these hormones at different times. So when people talk about, you know, HPTA axis dysfunction, HBA, or even in females, when we start to get into, you know, ovarian dysfunction and things like that, they're just talking about that entire system or thermostat kind of being broken. It would be like if you're spending the summer in Florida without air conditioning, it would kind of suck. Or if you're in, um, you know, Wisconsin this past winter and it was super cold and you didn't have heat. So we want our thermostat to be tightly regulated and be able to work um, and really be able to manage and handle those different stressors. So what's interesting, though, is when people talk about HPA axis dysfunction, it's really not dysfunction. It's really our body is doing what it's supposed to do because we've basically given it so much stress. It's our body is basically trying to protect ourselves. It's sort of safety theory, as some doctors or medical professionals would call it. And so what we forget is that our body is sort of creating these compensatory mechanisms to cope with our surroundings, whether that's I'm constantly on, on blue light, I don't get outside, I don't get enough sleep, I'm not eating properly for my activity level. And so with someone like a CrossFitter, when they're experiencing HPA dysfunction, usually it's 
we need to change their training periodization, their volume, and we need to potentially eat more reverse diet or do something to basically help their body deal with the volume and capacity that they're undergoing from a, a volume of stress or tension standpoint to really help them recover. Uh, ultimately, uh, this fatigue that we're talking about is not really recognized in the medical community. Some people call it adrenal fatigue. Really, it's more of adrenal insufficiency. And uh, it's more so that it's not that our adrenal gland gets tired. It's not like when you or I, you know, we're awake, we work out, we have a full day, we're tired at the end of the day. It's more our adrenal glands are either uh, lacking some sort of raw material or in order to prevent the body from being overwhelmed with cortisol, it basically goes through this resistance phase where first we have this alarm of high cortisol and then progressively our body's like, eh, we probably don't want these high levels all the time. And eventually we get to a point where we have low cortisol, low DHT sulfate. So those athletes, usually what they're experiencing and what they're say when they're saying HPA axis dysfunction is they've gotten to a point where they have low cortisol in the morning likely also low DHEA sulfate levels, just in terms of like blood or urine markers that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So understanding cortisol, you realize, okay, my body has gone through all of this fatigue, all of this stress. And it's not so much that my adrenal glands can't necessarily do its job. It's that my brain, um, I used the example yesterday on one of our coaching calls. It was like, if I had a little brother that came down to Florida and just poked you with a like pencil all day long, and you're like, that's stress, right? He's just like really, 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 really annoying. Eventually you just kind of get fed up with that. You stop responding to it and you're like, I need to ignore him. Uh, that's sort of how the brain and the adrenals begin to communicate because you're basically, instead of using our cortisol as an acute stress response, which is what it's supposed to do, uh, we move to this place of chronic stress response and our body's like, this is not what I'm designed for. Why are you doing this to me? And then that's when you end up with those low levels in the morning in a perfectly healthy individual Ideally, we have a cortisol awakening response, which means higher levels of cortisol in the morning, and it works inversely to melatonin. So as the day goes on, our cortisol levels begin to come down. We're ready for relaxation and rest and sleep and recovery. And then melatonin is then elevated. It's kind of that shot that fires to help us sleep. So you know, in a healthy individual that doesn't have an adrenal insufficiency or issue or dysfunction or dysregulation, whatever you want to call it, imbalance... Um, they have cortisol. Cortisol is a good thing. We need it for energy breakdown. We need it for workouts. If our liver glycogen is low, it will actually like help to wake us up in the night to alert us to go get food. Uh, it's very practical in the sense of our survival and dealing with acute bouts of stress. The problem is, is that as a society, we're probably not the best at time management. We're probably not the best at stress management. Um, we have communication coming in all the time. We need to make decisions very rapidly. Uh, and it's not in the sense of, okay, I need to go grab this food. It's, it's really more so like an evolved stressor from an iPhone or your MacBook or yeah. your PC or something coming in, or maybe your work or family life or your children or anything like that. So just sort of segregating, thinking about like what taking an inventory of stress is really important in understanding your cortisol response as well. So, cause the labs can show you so much, but oftentimes we don't think about our day-to-day -day responsibilities as well as our training. Um, because usually it's, 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 there's a cognitive stress that goes along with the physical stress, right? It's like very, it would take an athlete working very, 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 very hard to reach that on its own. Usually it's a combination of training very, very hard under feeding and maybe they're going they're moving or there's a relationship issue or they're financial investor. There's something else going on that kind of creates this full uh, volume of stress that's going on in their life. So I realized that kind of like took us from the biological or chem like chemical component of stress to more of just practical day-to-day -day life application. But I try to get people to kind of pull like zoom out for a second and think of how our lives are different from you know, what we were originally programmed to do, which is simply just to survive and like kind of continue to go about our day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, iPhones weren't a part of that survival, you know, so just kind of making it a little bit more dumbed down in a way to make it sound a little more prehistoric. But um, obviously our bodies have, we can do amazing things. We've had these great inventions. We have great technology, but from a primal physiology pr perspective, we're still pretty basic. Yeah, you know, we have, we have a few, 
Yeah, it sounds like our bodies yeah. are not kind of meant for for that kind of purpose. And and if you were to kind of like split, because I talk to my clients a lot about this, like different kinds of um, the types of stress that you're kind of experiencing. So yeah. for example, like the emotional um, stress that obviously is a result of like finances and like, you know, I don't have enough money or like I have too much work and stuff like that. But then at the same time, you know, do, do you see a kind of like a difference as far as like the physical stress? So it's like obviously like, you know, beating your body down every single day with workouts and proper, improper period and like overtraining and things like that. And obviously at the same time uh, as under eating, is it the same kind of response in your opinion that occurs? Like your, your body kind of sees it as like, this is all stress and I'm just going to uh, secrete all these different neurotransmitters and cause all these changes or, or is there a difference between them in your opinion? I think it depends a little bit. And we have to remember, even with great periodization, your body doesn't know that a 315 pound deadlift or a 500 pound squat or a a hundred push-ups, our body doesn't really know how much weight is on the bar or how many calories you got on the aerodyne bike or how many meters you row on a concept two rower in CrossFit. Um, it's really more, um, and I, I feel like I want to wave at some of these people. I don't know if I can oh, wait, that's the filter. So I don't want to do that. I don't yeah, want to do that. If you're listening to this, like, um, I know there's like a way that you can do questions and we'll try to like answer some questions at the end. Um, remember this is a, this is a recording also through for the podcast. So if you're listening to this and, and you're watching and you can obviously listen to this after this and for 24 hours and then it'll be posted probably in a couple weeks or so. Um, anyways, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, getting back to that, basically, you know, on the bar, our body perceives tension and, and a volume of stress. And we know that we know from uh, more of a training or fitness background or strength and conditioning background, we know that the body specifically adapts to implied demands. And I would say that the one area where physical stress might be different than emotional stress is our body has certain compensatory mechanisms to deal with stress, right? Like if I make you lift more, you will build muscle, assuming you have the adequate nutri nutrition and nutrients to build that tissue, your body will positively adapt to that stress. I would argue that it, other than a certain level of mental and emotional resilience that we need as individuals to like function in society as adults, and I'm not a therapist or counselor, so I can't really educate people on that. But other than that, you know, I would argue like, where are we really benefiting from this emotional stress where are we benefiting from this acute stress other than being able to like kind of deal with it or we just have this this signal so i think from like a biochemical perspective there are definitely some differences i would i would even venture to say that the primary differences are if i go in for a training session or i walk five miles um or you know something of the sort i'm doing other things in my body at the same time that i'm signaling certain pathways, improving insulin sensitivity. I'm deriving other benefits from the training session besides just um, creating a cortisol response, a stress response, and muscle protein breakdown. I'm also creating this opportunity to then feed my body, to then grow and make positive ad adaptations to stress. With emotions, while you might mentally become more resilient or you can handle those emotions, it's not necessarily that like increasing my macronutrients that day or having a certain amount of leucine post emotion, you know, we're not, we're not like primed for anything really. Right. So I would say that the one difference there is that with training adaptations, we can, we have a little bit of control. We have a little bit of influence. We seem to have a greater understanding of how nutrition and um, our daily caloric allotments and requirements and our peri-workout nutrition, how all of these things can really go into ultimately managing that stress response and then coming back the next day and being even stronger, um, you know, assuming that, that our nutrition is in line, our calories are equated and all that good stuff. So I would say the main difference there is we have a lot more, um, there's area for growth and opportunity with those physical yeah. changes and we control those manipulations. You know, that's the entire industry of what the fitness industry is, what the field is, is understanding those adaptations and implica uh, implications, excuse me, um, on the body. So hopefully that makes sense for those of you no, guys at home, uh, from like a, a cognitive standpoint or just alertness. Yes. They're very, I would say they're similar. Like your body is preparing to deal with a threat. It's basically this antiquated portion of our brain that knows that there's stress around and, and it basically wants to wake us up so that we're aware of it, right? It's just an awareness tactic and tool. So flooding the body with, you know, whether it's adrenaline, norepinephrine, uh, dopamine, like creating this drive and this response, really where I view the downside there is, you know, different 
So when I talked about like signaling pathways, I'm thinking in terms of insulin or mTOR and things like that, that are kind of more advanced science that some of you nutrition coaches or fitness professionals may be familiar with. For those of you just kind of watching at home, wanting to learn about stress hormones, we don't have to dive into that today, but just simply understanding that we, we sort of prime and push different buttons when we train and when we work out, um, especially with resistance training, when we sort of flip different switches on and off uh, that sort of prepare the body to assimilate nutrients slightly differently. And now let's say, you have a fight with your parents or you argue with your brother or sister or someone sends you a nasty email. We didn't really prime anything in the body. We're just alert because it's upsetting and our body thinks it's threatening. Right. So yeah. I'd say that's the biggest distinction there is like, we didn't really, uh, we didn't really create any type of like ideal environment for, you know, our physiology or muscle growth or leaning out or body composition or anything like that. Okay. That makes sense. And one thing I wanted to actually touch base on, and this may be sort of a tangent, but sort of related. Um, you mentioned something, and I know you were talking about this on your stories recently, which is like the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity of your brain, essentially different yeah, system, yeah. nervous system. And, and the reason why I ask is because there's a lot of technologies right now that look at that. So for example, I have a client and I'm not sure if you're too familiar with this technology, this like a watch is called whoop. Um, and then there's okay. also like these people using like aura rings and stuff like that, which are measuring like readiness for like kind of like uh, training and stuff like that based on uh, the whole idea of like parasympathetic and sympathetic activation. So essentially gives them like this idea of like, yeah, your body is ready to train or your body's not ready to train. Can you kind of like shed some light on what that is like kind of like about like the sympathetic and parasympathetic activation and how does that relate to stress and, and, and possibly cortisol? For sure. So um, the way I explain parasympathetic and sympathetic, and I am familiar with aura, I actually, um, I have one and I put it down on my counter or maybe it's over on the table before I moved over here to stand up. But, um, you know, I do use that for tracking primarily for the sleep benefits. Uh, but simply put, just, just rather than diving too much into the technology, focusing more on cortisol and everything, the, the parasympathetic and sympathetic, the way that I teach clients is thinking about uh, like draining and charging an electronic device. So we all have iPhones or maybe you have a Google smartphone or something like that. When we use it all day long and we send messages, we make phone calls, we do these things that are draining for it, we eventually need to plug it in at the end of the day. I think we have a large uh, number of expectations or a certain volume of things we like to get done within our body, whether that's physically, mentally, or related to our job and our occupation which I would say are pretty draining. It's kind of like when you drain your smartphone battery. And then during the day, we need to take inventory of that and make sure that we're doing things to charge ourselves, kind of like how you plug your phone in at the end of the day. Um, so a parasympathetic response would be like you charging yourself. For me, that's music or playing guitar or spending time with my dog or going for a walk or reading. Those things, or maybe foam rolling, stretching, breathing, post-workout, that's a way to shift back into parasympathetic. Eating and sleeping are also very um, anabolic, restorative, and by anabolic, I mean like muscle building or repair and recovery. Um, there are activities that can, can move you into a parasympathetic response. Simply having amino acids and carbohydrates and things like that will move you into that parasympathetic response. Whereas um, a sympathetic response would be, you know, when we actually go through a workout, maybe we have a stressful meeting, maybe we're working with clients, or maybe we're doing something in our day-to-day -day job. And ultimately, it's not that that's inherently bad by itself. It's when we stack like 10 of those activities and we have no balance. So what I like to do is do something as simple as like a T-chart or T-table and have coaches and clients sort of go through that and think about, you know, how much am I doing for me? And then how much, you know, would fall on this category of drains or some sort of sympathetic input? And then really just kind of... Uh, breaking that down for them to help see how even or uneven they are. Ideally, we get to a point where we're pretty even with those inputs. So for everything I'm doing, that's pretty stressful. Um, maybe I'm reading or spending time with my dog or playing music or making sure that my meals are supporting my activity level, all of those things. Some people like meditation or yoga. Really, it's, it's about finding what works best for you and your personality type. So I don't try to like force that stuff on people, but that does help to distinguish between parasympathetic and sympathetic states. I think those words are just kind of like big fancy science words. It's a lot easier for people to just think about, charge okay, this sort of, yeah, it's and, and draining and charging or charge and recharge, or um, just remember that like a sympathetic or fight or flight response or cortisol response is an acute stress response. 
And that ultimately we don't want to be pushing that button all the time in our body. Um, that would be pretty inefficient. It's, it's also not realistic in terms of our, our long-term health or our balance as human beings. So um, I think that's probably the, the yeah. most simplistic way to, to break that down for people. And, you know, if you guys have questions, certainly uh, drop, drop some comments or lines below and, and I can, I can break that down a little further if we need to. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. And I think the best way I explain it and like how to actually feel when sympathetic is activated versus parasympathetic is imagine you're about to step on stage and you're just super nervous about that kind of stuff and your heart starts to race. And for no apparent reason, you're just kind of standing in there. That's like your sympathetic, uh, you know, kind of system, like kind of getting activated, getting yeah. ready to go, like, you know, making all it's like, like the yeah. scene in it's a scene in eight mile, you know, it's like when Eminem is getting ready to like rap, do his first rap yeah. battle and he's all nervous and he throws up. Yeah. That's, that's your sympathetic <laughs> that's, nervous that's system. Sympathetic activity. <laughs> activity that's awesome there you go now let's switch your conversation into the effect on nutrition because a lot of people have been asking me about this like actually once somebody i'm actually going to put this on here um actually ask how high cortisol levels are so to correlate it with central adiposity and for people listening in that know not know exactly what that is it's essentially like the, the fat around your your belly around fat around your abdomen uh, abdominal area or so um so can you kind of elaborate a bit more on what is the effect on some of these different things as far as like how your body is using fuels and how they're actually being stored uh, whenever your cortisol levels are high versus when they're actually low or like chronically I that, elevated? I yeah. Guess. If you have chronically elevated cortisol, there's a couple of things that happen. One is there's a chance that you have blood sugar elevation, even when you haven't necessarily consumed carbohydrate. Um, which can lead to some insulin dysregulation. Oftentimes, because cortisol is also super high, it goes hand in hand with gut issues. Um, so leaky gut and inflammation, and we trigger inflammatory cytokines. The brain then releases corticosteroids as a way to quell that inflammation and kind of calm things down. And we end up with this perpetual response. However, I think with a lot of uh, with a lot of clients, I'm, I'm really I, I, there's a huge sort of toss up or controversy around this. I'm very hesitant to just be like, yes, your body fat is from cortisol because there's so many bad infomercials out there. There's so much misinformation about people, you know, who maybe simply need to achieve a caloric deficit and track their macronutrients and be active and, and, and move their body. They can lose that adipose tissue or fat that they're talking about. Um, however, there's also a subset of the population where I do notice they sort of have this propensity to store fat in that area. Uh, but also I do see that when we bring the stress levels down, we also lose things like water weight because of the inflammation that's there in the body. We also forget that the, um, because the kidneys and adrenals and, and all these different organs sort of speak to each other and work with each other. I think sometimes we forget that there's other hormones out there like aldosterone or aldosterone, however you want, however you'd like to pronounce it for fluid balance. And ultimately we can be retaining more water where folks feel like they have all this adipose tissue in their like midsection when really it's your fight or flight response and maybe salt, sweat, other things that are going on in your body that are ultimately causing imbalances in fluid regulation. Uh, so this is an area where we kind of dive down this rabbit hole. It's, it's like 10 to one and a half dozen to the other. You could argue it either way, but ultimately the bottom line is you need to mitigate that stress, pull them out of it. And ultimately, you still need to do a food log, figure out their macronutrients. Do they need a reverse diet? Do they need a calorie deficit? And you're still going to really approach it the same way. We can't, I can't magically go in and like find certain receptors in your body and like make you lose fat in that area. You know, it's, it's sort of unrealistic as a coach and expectations, even um, whether you are a coach and that question was for a client or whether that was for yourself. Um, ultimately, we need to kind of zoom back out to what we've talked about so far on the, on the call, which is like examining those drains and charges, examining the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, um, examining what we can do to control that cortisol, making sure it's largely tilt shifted towards the morning so that we have a cortisol awakening response and then mm -hmm. uh, lower levels of cortisol in the evening, higher levels of melatonin. And that's really the best that we can do ultimately in, in moving our body because that will ultimately improve body composition. We kind of know that. And there's, there's several reasons behind that, but I would argue, how do we know that it's central adiposity from cortisol or corticosteroids and, and not because, well, your circadian rhythm is messed up you get less sleep. And we know that with less sleep, we see up to a 20% change in testosterone levels, which can 
definitely impact adipose tissue in the midsection as well as changes in your estrogen receptors, estrogen levels, um, and fat storage there. We know that changes just for men and women, lack of sleep increases cravings. It decreases insulin sensitivity. So then if your cortisol is high, okay, are we blaming cortisol for the fat storage or are you getting less sleep and then you have cravings and you veer off your diet and you have, because of the poor insulin sensitivity, you can't get away with eating as many carbs. And then you store those carbs as fat because you're no longer in a calorie deficit. It's like, which wheel do you want to look at? What science game do you want to play? And like, we could, I'm sure we could find like 17 people on the internet to argue with right now. But the truth is, is that I think we all know on some level that a balance of all those considerations is needed to ultimately make people healthy and make them feel better. And so I don't like to like overcomp. I mean, there's definitely some research out there. There's some articles and we could talk about central fat storage or we could talk about cortisol and, and gut yeah. Um, dysregulation, inflammation. I think, I think the main consideration there is that what's happening with blood sugar in the bloodstream, what's happening with inflammation, what's happening with the gut. And then as a result of that, with any dysregulations in cortisol, if it is elevated in the evening, are we running into sleep issues? If we have sleep issues, we're, we're going to have issues with leptin and ghrelin. Typically, we have upregulated hunger hormones of ghrelin. Um, we lose sensitivity to leptin, which is a very powerful hormone. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also notice changes in that insulin sensitivity when we do actually eating the amount that our nutrition coach maybe has prescribed or that maybe I prescribed for a client. So I try to like move back up, higher up in the chain. And, and I know um, one of your coaches and friends, you know, Tony Stefan talks about like the lowest hanging fruit, right? So hormones are really cool. And I can tell you the science all day, but ultimately with your clients, there's probably like five things that are lower, like hanging pieces of fruit than me, you know, diving into corticosteroids and fat storage in the midsection. Yeah. I would bet that 90% of the time your clients are either having a sleep issue, a um, macronutrient related issue, a cravings issue, an energy level related issue um, that we can tackle those first. And then if you want to message me privately or DM, or you want to talk about research studies on, on those yeah. I'm more than you know, happy to do that. I just think for the majority of the audience watching, yeah. um, it Try would be a disservice. It. Yeah. I want to, I want to simplify it and, and for the audience watching and then eventually listening on the podcast, like it would be a disservice of me, me to you guys, like to throw these big words out there and not actually make it actionable. Right. Like, there's only, there's so much that we can do through lifestyle training and nutrition. And I'd rather that someone understands 80% of what I say, but takes action on a hundred percent of it, than um, understands less than half of what I say. And they can't even communicate it to a client or excuse me, they, you know, maybe understand what I say, but they can't communicate it to a client, take action on it or implement it as far as like habit-based coaching and lifestyle changes. So um, yeah, it's, I think that, that could be like a whole other podcast in itself. I feel like, well, I guess I like also wanted to ask you, but I, I think that I know the answer to this because you, you've been kind of talking about it because it seems like this is like a spider web. It's like many different things that are connected and interrelated with each other that actually affects like the results that people <laughs> are sometimes are not getting because of many different uh, factors that come into play from sleep, from like stress management, from um, under eating, which I wanted to just kind of stop by. And again, I think I know the answer what, you, what you're going to tell me, but you know, a lot of people that you see coming into you, and I think we talked about this in the first podcast we did, is like the under eating aspect of things. And again, going right. back to like the high elite level athletes, um, and, and they come to me and, and I'm sure to you as well, it's like, well, I'm not eating that much. I don't understand. I'm not really seeing changes. I'm not really seeing that fat loss. And obviously when, when we kind of like, let's just kind of put this a scenario in which like, you know, we kind of consider all things like I'm sleeping. Okay. Um, stress levels are a little high. I'm not eating enough and I'm training like 67 days a week, like chronically, like, you know, I'm doing like lots of like two hours and stuff like that. How does like that under eating truly affect, um, you know, and, and if you can kind of come up with maybe like three to four things that, you know, would come up on the, on top of your head, like to ask a client, um, what would be those right. like main things that you would normally say, or you would normally see? Yeah. I mean, I'm super glad you asked that question. So for an athlete, what ends up happening when cortisol is elevated is we cortisol inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3. So quick lesson for those of you at home, T4 is produced by the thyroid. The is converted into metabolically active T3. And T3 uh, is responsible to sort of rev our metabolic engine. So if you have an athlete who's under eating, and as a result, um, let's say 
they could really benefit from something like insulin around their workout, more carbohydrates, more food. We're then blunting cortisol. We lower cortisol, which then won't act on all these other hormones. So I love what you said about it is a spider web because thyroid connects to cortisol. Women's health connects to cortisol. Men's health connects to cortisol. They all work together in glycemic regulation. That connects as well. And so using that example of that athlete who's under eating, you know, the first thing that pops into my head is, okay, this stress response, if it's triggering more cortisol, how is it impacting, you know, you're saying they're sleeping okay, but now I begin to think, okay, well, they're undernourished in the sense that maybe they have lower glycogen levels, um, that's impacting the amount of blood sugar availability, and are they going hypoglycemic during training? What is that causing the body to do from a cortisol response to stress response? That stress is basically making the thyroid hormone that the body is producing less act, uh, less active or metabolically sort of available to take action. When that happens, then our body signals back up to the brain and it's like, yo, brain, we don't have enough thyroid hormone. So then it tells the pituitary to produce more stimulating hormone, which is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Mm -hmm. And and that's how we end up with with, uh, basically like stress-induced hypothyroidism. That's why you see a lot of folks with HPA issues or hypothyroidism that, that aren't naturally overweight. They're not obese. They're probably type A, highly motivated people who train really hard and don't eat enough. And that's where a reverse diet comes in. Is a reverse diet through proper placement of carbohydrates, proper placement of proteins and fats. We're actually lowering that cortisol response, which then allows our body to sort of optimize that to T3 conversion in the liver and the gut. We're bringing those cortisol levels down, probably allowing for even better sleep because athletes need even more sleep than a regular individual in most cases, unless they're just super efficient at achieving slow wave sleep, REM sleep, and their light sleep as well. Um, and by, by doing that, now you start to see how we're moving through the chain and making everything else more effective. If there's more T3, we're not overproducing TSH and stressing our body to the point where we end up with this, this hypothyroidism or anything like that. So food is, is huge. It's an engine that can control all of these things. Macronutrients are a toggle and a window to sort of control these hormones. And I think people forget about it sometimes. So I'd say the number one thing that would, people would forget in that athlete overtraining scenario is really um, what's happening with that, that cortisol T4 to T3 conversion is sometimes we end up with higher levels of reverse T3 and reverse T3 and what's going on with a deitinase enzyme that sort of breaks these, these thyroid molecules down uh, is basically that they compete at the thyroid receptor site uh, to act on thyroid receptors in our body, which is basically what is our met- like metabolically keeping us moving, helps with fat loss, helps with energy, helps with our cells and, and everything that we need on a day-to-day basis. So that's probably the number one thing that I think has been overlooked and people don't understand that these hormones are, don't live in silos. I mean, even when I first began to get into nutritional endocrinology and things like that, I didn't really understand like, okay, cortisol relates to thyroid and also testosterone and these other cells and all of these receptors all over our body. So that's a huge one. Um, I would also think that just from a, a general fatigue standpoint and adrenal insufficiency, someone who's under eating and overtraining to that level, what's going on in the central nervous system, the number of sympathetic inputs, we're basically moving them through uh, adrenal stages of uh, basically their stage one, two, three, some medical professionals or dietitians and, and nutrition coaches will argue there's like four stages, but the number of stages doesn't matter. Really all that matters is you start with high cortisol as your body in an alert or alarm phase you move into more of a resistance phase. So it's kind of this gradient scale where with that gradient scale, we're, we're getting to a point where we're sort of bottoming out on our cortisol, we're bottoming out on DHEA sulfate. So that's why they feel crummy. And then they're not going to, that, that's when you see athletes where they're like over relying on caffeine to get going into the gym, have a hard time stimulating the central nervous system, things like that. So sometimes changing the type of work that they're doing, the type of volume that they're doing, um, giving, variety in their training, mixing in, and then also making those dietary changes can be, you know, really, really huge. So, um, that's where, you know, in that case, like a reverse diet could be super powerful. Those athletes, I think that was mainly two things, but I think that hit like a lot of stuff yeah. within those two things. So of those two or three, like considerations yeah. for athletes. No, that's, that's so important. And I think like, again, back to the conversation for people listening in, it's like the connection between all those different things It's not just like, you know, do A, B and C, and then everything's going to get fixed because a lot of times it just goes 
it always goes way beyond nutrition. And I think I see it in many clients, you know, like chronic under eaters that are too afraid to eat too much. They are too afraid to consume too many calories because like, well, what's going to happen as a, re- as a result of that? And I love the fact that you mentioned the whole reverse dieting thing, which is essentially a structure increase in calories to get your, to make your, your body go into more of a um, kind of optimize your metabolism. So it's actually working sure. with, not against you. It's usually kind of like the way I explain it. Yeah. Um, so I think that's when we. Yeah. And when we think about metabolism and why reverse dieting works, I think people forget metabolism isn't just calories in calories out calories matter. And we know that calorie deficit plays a huge role in insulin sensitivity, plays a huge role in weight loss or weight gain. But we need to understand that the metabolic equation includes things like thermic effect of food, non-exercise related activity, thermogenesis. So when we eat less, so take that athlete, for example, even if they're doing a two a day, he or she may sit around the rest of the day and not really do anything in terms of neat. I mean, you can even watch videos of famous other nutrition coaches like Lane Norton or other you know guys out there where literally their eye movement slows down, their hand movement slowed down, they go for less walks, they don't want to get up and do other things around the house, um, literally because neat is changing because we're underfed as an athlete. So all of a sudden you start feeding them more and the reverse diet works because you get an increase in non-exercise related activity thermogenesis. Um, the thermic effect of food increases, which is also a small percentage of metabolism. And not only that, but we're potentially building some muscle and we put that mu- muscle into motion. We're now also consuming and expending calories in the form of trying to build that metabolically active tissue, that muscle tissue that plays on that equation. And then from the BMR perspective, that's what I was talking about with thyroid. So BMR is basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate. And when we're underfed, we get a decrease in RMR or BMR, even if we're kind of like around that same uh, body type, because basically that's what was happening when we're getting less thyroid output. So simply by increasing the output of the thyroid, we could be a similar body size, but our RMR or BMR would increase, ultimately changing our net calorie um, TDEE, right? So our total daily energy expenditure would shift. Um, And that's how sometimes you can reverse diet someone, but they actually end up with like a better calorie balance than if they were in a greater deficit. It's kind of crazy. But you tend um, to see a lot of times whenever like you start to increase their calories, people start to like at first, like it's like really kind of fighting that resistance. Like, you know, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. But then as like, as people start to kind of move through the process and like you start to see like the hunger level start to change. Now I'm feeling hungry. Energy is kind of changing. I'm like, I have more like this this position for working out and all kinds of stuff like that. So all these changes that are happening as a result, right? Right. And those are hormonal and neurotransmitter changes for the most part. That's upregulating appetite. Maybe you're having changes um, in leptin or ghrelin. You could have changes in your thyroid hormone. Um, There's really so many things that could be going on in the body because you're basically alleviating a form of stress or tension on the body, right? So um, that's where reverse dieting can be a really beautiful thing for so many different use cases from, um, you know, the, the... female that just wants to lose five or 10 pounds for her wedding all the way through to, you know, a uh, uh, athlete who's training for the CrossFit games or someone who's pre bodybuilding contest preparation. There's so many ways we can use these tools and applications to impact a really broad audience of different people. Once we understand the nature of metabolism and kind of the uh, neuroendocrine system and, and, thermostat that goes on from like a metabolic and hormonal standpoint for sure. Awesome. Now, um, just to kind of finish up, because I want to make sure we're respectful of your time. I wanted to kind of chat a little bit more just application. So and talking more about, let's just say, you know, somebody that may be going through chronic high levels of cortisol and stuff like that. You know, what are some like, you know, key things that you try to focus on with your clients? And I guess we already talked about reverse dieting. So let's say that we're already kind of tackling that. Um, What are some Mm -hmm. other things as far as like, you know, managing stress and managing kind of like uh, some of those areas um, that can be helpful to like help out with cortisol levels and make sure that the curve is more normal, I guess, and like the rhythm of cortisol levels, it's more controlled. Depending on how extreme it is, I mean, I might start with saying pick two or three lifestyle activities that really benefit you. Um, so, you know, we use my example, mine might be a, a pet, like my dog going for walks playing guitar, doing something like that. Um, for other folks, I just sort of take, I, I ask like, okay, what did you enjoy, enjoy doing growing up? Right? Like, did you enjoy drawing? Did you enjoy music? Like what's always kind of brought you happiness or brought you joy, um, in those activities. Then we move beyond that into kind of as an adult, uh, you know, what areas, like, how are you allocating your use of free time? How are you, um, showing up like at work and what, what things are consistent stressors across the week that we can really manage that are realistic? Because I can't, 
keep your kid from getting hungry at 2 30 PM in the afternoon when you need to like give them a snack or something. I, but what I can do is I can make observations and patterns of behavior and make suggestions based off of that. Or I could say, you know what, you had such a great check-in last week. And you know what, from what I remember, I think you actually took a walk in the park with your husband and then you had some time with the kids and then you went and like, you really enjoy this one type of music and you went to this concert, right? So I'll start to see patterns just as a human being. And I'll try to incorporate two or three of those things every single week, uh, really looking at like the entire person and what you can do for them. Uh, nutritional preferences. Like if someone gets super stressed out by trying to like fix breakfast in the morning or something, moving them to like a modified intermittent fat, like even if they're reverse dieting, I can still play with their eating timing and all these different things that alleviate stress based off of their schedule. Um, we can change their training from maybe more of like a CrossFit or higher impact style of training or interval training to um, more hypertrophy based with some walking or something like that. That can certainly make a huge difference in cortisol. And then lastly, um, I, I'm always hesitant to sort of mention this, but supplements and adaptogens and natural compounds can definitely play a very large role in resetting circadian rhythm and helping where I think I see coaches go wrong is they don't understand that there's a difference between stimulating adaptogens and calming restorative or um, balance, balancing adaptogens. The concept of an adaptogen is that it adapts depending on if you need stimulation, you know, um, it will help with that. If you need relaxation, it will do that. Some do both. Um, and some do not do both. So like Panax ginseng would be more stimulating, whereas ashwagandha can kind of do both for people. Okay. Uh, amino acids like L-glycine or L-theanine would help someone calm down and you'd want to probably take it in the evening and it can help with that evening sleep cycle, cortisol awakening response or pairing it with caffeine will make you less jittery. So there's definitely some uh, nootropics and adaptogens and things out there that can help people, but that's like our fourth or fifth or sixth step after number one nutrition yeah. number two stress management time management number three training periodization exercise volume if you're nailing all of that it's kind of like i give you the key to un unlock here's some extra supplement cake. strategies yeah it's yeah. the icing on the cake and and they can be really solid like i've seen great results some clients do very very well with adaptogens do very very well with um you know some of these things are just amino acids like uh we know that you know, taking L-tyrosine earlier in the day with caffeine has more of a stimulating effect, uh, whereas taking L-theanine or L-glycine, uh, you know, in the evening has can have a little bit of a calming effect. Or 5-HTP, uh, which is 5-hydroxytryptophan, is a precursor to serotonin. It can help with anxiety. It's been uh, studied along with SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Wobutrin, which are used for anxiety and cognitive uh, mental, like basically mental health cases or... Uh, depressive disorders, you know, anxiety, things like that. So really there's this whole host of available items out there. I would just encourage coaches and, and athletes and individuals that prior to just sort of jumping on a supplement regimen, make sure you understand like the role of each product and that everything sort of serves a different purpose. And that depending on your use case and depending on your history that, you know, we want to make sure that you're on the right things. There are some universally safe ones, so um, that's fine. But when you start to combine like four or five, six, seven things. And you don't know what they're all doing. Like I've had some people come to me and they're like, well, my circadian rhythm's off or I have high cortisol and they're taking holy basil, rolora, ashwagandha, um, and, uh, ginseng and all these other things. And like, they're not even like, we're not getting a proper amount of sleep. Our macronutrients are off. And like, yeah. we're not on a, we, do you consistently track your training? Do you know what kind of program you're on? And the answer is like, no. So you missed like one through three, right? So yeah. always focus on, always focus on lifestyle, time management, scheduling, um, training, nutrition, and sleep would always, always, always come before, um, supplementation. If you're, if you know what you're doing with the supplementation, I think it can, it can move up a little bit and be used in conjunction with those top three or four. That's awesome, dude. Well, for people listening in, this is like, you know, some of like important things. So just to summarize, uh, focusing on like this first stages, which is obviously optimizing sleep, your nutrition and so forth, and leaving adaptogens and supplements, obviously as the last thing. Um, and obviously trying to obviously do your research when it comes down to that. Um, we may have time just one question that came in here that I think is really important. I'm going to put it on here on the screen, which is better time to work out to maintain cortisol levels at regular levels. And I guess like this is important to know because you kind of tend to see often that you know the curve so the curve actually tell the, you know shows like you know cortisol usually certain tends to kind of like come down towards the end of the day so is it actually beneficial or not beneficial to work out at night because a lot of people sometimes ask that specific question 
Yeah, I think we come back to like one through three, right? So training is definitely a part of it. Um, some people feel more alert and awake. What I see as an issue is to sleep, you need to maintain a comfortable body temperature. And if you have a really intense workout later in the day, it can be hard to bring your body temperature back down because we're elevating our core body temperature, our basal body temperature to a very high level. So ideally, my preference would be to move them to the morning. I, I think... I think you can do it either way. Assuming you can cool the person down, you can get them in a parasympathetic state and just like get them ready for sleep. The problem I see is some people will like train eight to 9 PM and then try to go to bed at 10 PM. Their body temperature is still elevated. They didn't have time to really have proper post-workout nutrition and they're just rushing everything, which just sounds stressful, right? It doesn't like yeah. help with a circadian rhythm or cortisol issue. It sounds stressful. So it's either make time for it in the morning, or if you're going to do it in the evening, set it up in a way where you have time to wind down for sleep. I mean, I actually heard this, uh, this was more on, more on a bit business podcast, but, um, we, uh, basically, you know, when we're kids, our parents have a bedtime routine for us or our, our caretakers, whoever is taking care of us. Uh, we have kids, you know, they have a bedtime routine. And as we get to be adults, we kind of forget that like there's a process of going to sleep and winding down and, you know, shutting things down, removing light, you know, not watching like Netflix till the absolute second that you fall, fall asleep. Some people do well with TV, other people don't. Um, and just understanding the different like levels of stimulation and, and things that go on in your brain. Like right now, you know, as much as I love talking to you, I have to accept, you know, my optic nerves are like looking at a screen and that screen basically is pulling in light. And so, um, you know, that would not be like the best way to, to wind down per se. And I have blue light blocking glasses somewhere, yeah, but uh, I'm not, I'm not, I should, I know I'm not wearing them. I'm not style. I'm not styling and profiling for you guys, but, uh, <laughs> I'd say, you know, if you can get that body temperature down, if you can get pro proper post-workout nutrition and it keeps you consistent with your exercise routine, exercise will help your sleep in some sense. And if it helps with your nutrition and staying on your nutrition plan, uh, for some people, it's just a consistency thing. I think that adherence is the number one factor. If working out after work is the only time you can get it in at its best, that's great, but be sure it's not compromising your sleep because sleep is probably equally as important, if not more important than training and nutrition. And sometimes I think sleep gets like thrown by the wayside in favor of training or nutrition, but the three of them really need to work in harmony. They kind of all lean on each other in order to, to be their best and, and to ultimately make us feel our best in terms of the physical goals that we're trying to pursue. So that's, um, that's probably the best way to sort of summarize that. If you love your evening workouts, you know, do it, but just be cognizant that you may be impacting your sleep try to get that body temperature under control, make sure you're not sacrificing your post-workout nutrition. Um, and that'd probably be like my top two or three that's things good. for that. That's awesome. And obviously there's a lot of, of these tips that you just did on your, your recent ebook. So I guess like, I just kind of wanted to, to kind of summarize this because I know you've been hyping a lot of people up about this and I'm super excited to read this, man. I'm, I'm going to be one of the first ones to get this <laughs> tell us because obviously this was like a lot of information crammed up into like a little under an hour. Um, but a yeah. lot of people need to read this stuff. So why don't you tell, um, you know, the people listening in on this podcast, or I guess like right now that are live on Instagram, um, how can people obviously find out more about this? Like somebody asked me, like literally I have on here, uh, somebody asked like good resource uh, to learn about hormones. <laughs> this is like <laughs> the perfect question. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been working Just on? Set me up. Yeah. What can, what yeah. can people actually find, uh, um, you know, more information about this? Yeah, so I recently wrote a, an ebook, a digital book or text called The Hormone Blueprint, which is basically managing um, our, our internal health and physiology through training, nutrition, and lifestyle. So it's not a medical textbook. It is not about prescription drugs. It's not about only hormones. It's about how lifestyle training and nutrition really connect and how hormones play a role in our physical goals. So I try to get people to understand that. 90% of the time, if you're a coach or if you're just a client on your own fitness journey, we have a physical goal at the end, whether that's to lose five pounds, improve our body composition, or we want more energy, we want to feel better, we want to be a different dress size or clothing size, whatever the case may be. But those are preceded by physi physiological changes. So if we can change our physiology, change our, our hormones, our internal health and well-being, we can shape the physical change that we want, which is most of the time as a coach, why people sort of come to us in the first place. Um, and then prior to that, what sort of precedes that physiological change are our practices and perceptions. So 
practices are things like how much sleep we get, our, our macronutrient routine uh, in terms of what we're eating for our daily calorie balance, uh, our exercise routine, that falls into routines and rituals that I classify as our daily practices. And then lastly, you know, we talked a little bit about mindset today. We talked about managing stress. Those fall into perception. So really, I try to layer this to get people to see how there's different buckets of our lives that things fall into and how it ultimately feeds into the physical goals that we're trying to accomplish. So uh, the ebook is, is a, uh, a great resource if, if you're overwhelmed by uh, like combining and packing things into an hour's time. Uh, I would say that it's great for intermediate uh, to advanced trainees in their own transformation. Or if you're a coach, I think you'd, you'd certainly be able to handle it and digest the information. You can always reread it. We're also doing a few bonuses in terms of um, access to potential seminar footage, um, different interviews and expert guest interviews that I've done that haven't been released to the public, as well as two calls that I've done as a part of my private mentorship that you'll have access to in this um, in this particular uh, ebook release. So That's awesome. I will be posting this information on um, on my personal Instagram, which is Sam Miller Science, as you can see from here. So definitely follow along. I always post the updates in my stories. Uh, the first folks that will be getting this are my advanced newsletter list. So my advanced email list for coaches, uh, they will, you know, have that initial access to it. We will do a pre-sale. Uh, this will be dropping likely this week for the pre-sale. Um, for those of you listening to the podcast, we kind of recording this, uh, earlier in, in April, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have the pre-sale this week, which I guess falls around, you know, the 25th or so of April. And then about a week later, we'll go to that full release, not pre-sale. Um, so if you're looking to grab it uh, with potentially a little bit of a discount, you can go ahead and, and hop on there. Yeah. But uh, it's called the Hormone Home, Hormone Blueprint. And I'll definitely have the link in my Instagram bio. Uh, you can always direct message me if you're having any issues with anything. We will have a web page up for that. Um, and then for the podcast, uh, what I can do is make sure that it's in the radio show notes and then give a copy of that link so that folks have access to it and everything yeah. if, if they find that information valuable. That'd be awesome, dude. And I think by the, just for people listening, as if you're watching live, of course, this is April 24th. Um, so right now there's nothing right now, but then just stay on top of, you know, Sam's uh, Instagram and his social media. Um, but by the time this podcast releases in probably about three weeks, it will probably already be released, I guess, or I guess like will be. For sure. Of, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll definitely kind of like link it up, link it up on the show notes so people can like, you know, go and buy it, download it, whatever may be the case. Um, and so you can kind of like dive into that, man. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to be one of the first ones on that pre-sale list, dude. I appreciate that, man. I love it. Yeah, no, the, the pre-sale will be super soon. We're, we're actually like in the final days of just sort of uh, getting that page up for all of you just to make sure everything goes smoothly. And uh, then on top of that, after, you know, having that, basically all I mean is there'd be just be a slight difference in price. So when the podcast releases, if you're just catching that, I'm obviously sorry, but there's obviously benefits to following us on Instagram. You get the scoop yeah. on, on things first. So um, I appreciate you having me on today, man. And I, yeah. and all the support and kind of shouting out the ebook and everything. Uh, I'll be posting some user feedback and testimonials and things in my stories as well. So for those of you who are like, Hmm, this book sounds interesting, but I'm skeptical. I want to learn more. Uh, just go ahead and check out some of the highlights and stuff. And um, also probably re-listen to the live will help as well. Um, and always feel free to reach out with any questions. Happy to help you guys. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, looking forward to doing more podcasts in the future and looking forward to read that book, man. For sure. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Take care. You have been listening to Vita Nutrition Radio. A couple of things before you take off. If you enjoyed this episode, please, I would love to get your feedback. So feel free to drop down a review and I will be forever grateful. Also, if you like this podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button. We have it on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And lastly, if you would like to receive a freebie from me, make sure you sign up for our newsletter at www.vive-nutrition.com. See you guys in the next episode. Ciao, ciao.